you would think I'm stupid if I send a text message and stay glued to my phone waiting for a response. So why do we do it all the time in our code? It's very common to write code to send a request over the network, wait for a response, and then continue to execute the code. But it's not the only way to implement a request response communication. I have years of experience working with distributed systems. And in this video, I'll show you how to implement delayed response, the benefits of this approach, and the trade-offs. This video is part of a 10 episode series on microservices communication, but the concepts discussed here are applicable to any distributed system. Let's take a video service that sends a request to a transcript service and the transcript service converts the video audio into text and returns a response. But the transcript service could take a very long time to generate the text. You don't want the video service to wait for the transcript service to finish. But fortunately, there is a very common solution to solve this problem. So let me show you how it works. The video service sends a message to a channel. Think of it like dropping a letter in the mailbox. Then the transcript service checks the mailbox picks up the letter and processes it when it's ready. The video service sends a message and doesn't wait for the transcript service to process it. It doesn't matter if the transcript service is up, down, slow or fast. The video service just sends the message and moves on. These types of channels from one service to another are called point to point channels. They can also be called queues. This is a very simple way to implement asynchronous communication but the communication is only going in one direction. So we have a request, but we don't have a response. But the video service in this case needs a response with the text generated by the transcript service. The request is sent to the transcript service asynchronously in a non-blocking way. But we also want the response to be sent back to the video service in a non-blocking way. A single point-to-point -point queue is not enough. Just like we have a request channel, what we need is a reply channel. So here is how it works. The video service sends a message into a request queue. And after processing the message, the transcript service will send a response by sending a message to the reply queue. Simple, right? But not so fast. It's not just one video we're dealing with. There could be thousands of videos, which means thousands of messages to handle. And if the transcript service can process multiple requests in parallel, or if there are multiple instances of the transcript service running, the response messages will be sent to the reply queue in a different order than the request received in the request queue. So how does the video service knows which request message a response message in the reply queue correspond to? In the message payload, we need to add some additional information to link the request and the response. A unique identifier that we call a correlation ID can be used. And here is how it works. When the video service sends a request message to the transcript service, it will generate a unique identifier and add it to the message payload. The transcript service will process the message and when it sends the response, it will include the same unique identifier in the response message. Having a correlation ID makes the system more scalable. So let's say you have multiple instances of the video services and multiple instances of the transcript service running. When a video service send a request message to the transcript service, any instance of the transcript service can process the message. And when the transcript service sends a response message, any instance of the video service can process the response. So we have a request channel and a reply channel. So we can use multiple instances of these services, but clearly this has drastically increased the complexity of the system. Is it really worth it? Let me try to convince you of the power of asynchronous request response. Let's say that when the transcript service is done converting the audio to text, it needs to call a translation service to translate the text into a different language. Implementing a chain of communication with synchronous request response can cause cascading failure if a service down the chain has a problem. In our scenario, if the translation service goes down, everything stops. The transcript service gets stuck and the video service is left waiting. As a result, the video never gets published. On the other hand, with asynchronous request response communication style, when a video is published, the video service sends a message to the transcript service via a queue and the video gets published without any delay. After processing the message, the transcript service will send a message with the original language text to the video reply queue. But the transcript service will also post a message to the translation service in another queue. 
so the translation service can take as long as it needs to process the request. In the meantime, the video service and the transcript service can continue to process other incoming messages. Messages will continue to flow through the system, and if the translation service is slow, the queue will buffer the messages waiting to be processed. But that's not all. If the translation service is completely down and the message can't be delivered, we can retry to send the message later. It's a shame that the video can't be translated, but at least it can be published. And that's a much better experience than not allowing the video to be published at all. More often than not, a message broker can be used to provide messaging queues. And on top of point-to-point -point communication, some brokers can allow you to create channels that can be used to broadcast messages to multiple services. These enable a different type of asynchronous communication style that can be extremely powerful. So watch this next video to see the use cases that this type of communication unlocks.